Welcome to this podcast is making me thirsty. The number one destination for Seinfeld fans. This episode 65. Today's guest is an Emmy award winning television writer, a Writers Guild nominee, and a New York Times bestselling author of the renowned Nils Shapiro series of books. He has been a producer and writer on several hit shows, including The New Adventures of Old Christine, Ellen, Wizards of Waverly Place, Call Your Mother. And of course, he worked as a writer and producer on season one through season three of Seinfeld. Please welcome Matt Goldman. Matt, thanks for joining. Hey, thanks for having me. Matt, welcome to the program. I feel like, you know, this is Seinfeld royalty here, so we're excited. So <laughs> take us back. Um, how this all start? How, I mean, I know you were you were a stand up comic in in Minneapolis, but how did you connect with Jerry and Larry, and and how the whole whole Seinfeld experience begin for you? Well, I first met Jerry. I mean, I was a huge fan of his. I was a stand up here. He came to Minneapolis to work at a comedy club. Um, I can't remember what that place sat, but a couple hundred people. So he sold out ten shows in one week, which was a lot. And they had me open for him. Um, and uh, because I, I hadn't been doing stand up that long, but I tended to uh, have a, I, I had a clean act because my only goal was to get on the Tonight Show. So that uh, it wasn't out of prudishness or anything. I just thought you have to be clean on the Tonight Show. So I'll, I'll do my stuff clean. And I didn't cover a lot of typical stand up areas like the difference between LA and New York and stuff like I didn't do those bits so uh that's why I tended to open for people and I was really lucky to get to open for Jerry and uh we hit it off we became friends after that and shortly after that I moved to LA and we stayed friends so I it was luck it was it was luck <laughs> so the the one of your first I think it was the first one you was the robbery the first um yeah. episode that you wrote right and in, in there we were just talking about before you know higher before you came on um you know jerry is visiting minnesota when he gets robbed in that episode right. was that sort of yeah you, that's why you tied that in there because the minnesota connection yeah and uh <laughs> yeah story or no well jerry's got robbed a lot that well, that part was absolutely true all mm -hmm. those early seinfelds started with some kernel of of a, a true story um and you know that that the robbery was a really interesting one in the process and the evolution, not because I wrote of it, but slightly because I wrote it, because it was the first one that Jerry and Larry didn't write. So in the right. rewrite process, they had to come from the outside a little more than the ones that they just made up sitting on opposite sides of a partner's desk. And I think um, that rewrite process helped them define what the show was in their head a little more because they had to um uh so it was it was interesting you know i was 26 or 27 when that i mean i was a kid it was in and and none of us had ever worked on a sitcom before <laughs> that was the other funny thing that was you know anything i've worked on that turned out to be good felt like a bunch of kids messing around in the garage and that show is no exception um so uh, so those guys, I remember when we, we kind of talked out the first stories for the Seinfeld Chronicles, those four, and then Larry and Jerry went back to New York and I stayed in LA and, and wrote the robbery and they, they would send me drafts and, and they'd say, what do you think? And I'd say, it's great, but I think it's 20 pages too short. <laughs> so, I mean, like we didn't know but, I, I, and I was guessing, like, I think they're supposed to be longer. <laughs> like all that stuff we kind of figured out in process. And we were lucky that the show came up through late night and specials. It didn't come up through primetime comedy. So they didn't know either. So it was right. just a bunch of like people like knocking our heads against the wall and having a blast doing it and figuring things out. Yeah. Right. You had kind of a, the, the primetime specials kind of longer leash. So so mid eighties, you said essentially mid eighties, Jerry was in Minneapolis. You, yeah. you kind of um, opened for him and whatnot, but just take us back. Like, so 89, Larry and Jerry get the call. You're in LA. Like you're one of the main guys like to, to kick this show off. Like did Jerry just call you and say, Hey, I, I got a spot for you. Kind of how did, 
How did that yeah, play? He, like, would he be my called, writer, producer? He had called, uh, you know, first they made a pilot without a lane and they passed mm -hmm. on that. And then I don't, maybe you guys know why. I don't know why they changed their mind and, and said, we'll give you four more if you add a female character. And that's where Elaine came in. And then, yes, Jerry called me and a guy named Pat Hazel, whose credit you'll see up there also on some, and said, do you guys want to come work on the show? And I worked on scripts. And Pat, who's a stand-up who worked with Jerry, who's also a writer, but he really focused on those interstitial stand-up beats that were on okay. the, in, in the beginning of that show, the first few years, whatever it right. was. He would go to... Uh, you know, we'd work all day and then Pat would go with Jerry to the improv and work out those bits. So, um, but yeah, it's like, hey, I want you guys, if Pat and I had written a play and Jerry really liked it, so he said, I want both of you guys to come over. Um, uh, Larry seemed fine with it. You know, I met Larry after I was hired. Um, I had a ton of respect for him because he was so true to his voice. Uh, right. And so was Jerry, by the way. I got I mean, I feel like I was really lucky to be there and I got a front row seat to see some pretty amazing stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting too, because you had mentioned before we came on, I mean, you're from Minneapolis and you, you kind of mentioned that you have that admiration towards New York and here you are on a, on a New York centric show that everyone called like to New York when it first came out and you were one yeah. of the main guys at the beginning writing these things. And, you know, even like the robberies about New York, him getting robbed in New York all the time. The strange yeah, yeah. you also wrote is, you know, has that dynamic of going out of the city and trying to get back from, from outside the city. So um, whether you were from New York or not, you definitely hit the nail on the head on, on both of those two. Yeah, I, guess, I mean, I just tried know. to listen really hard to those guys. I mean, like when you're in the Midwest, you say you get in line to see a movie. And in New York, you say you're online to see a movie. And like those kind of things I really tried to listen to. And also they went over everything. I mean, so anything I got wrong, they would fix. There, there's no doubt about it. You know, when I, um, so it was interesting. I mean, it, it was, I, I didn't know what uh, informative and special, I knew it was informative and special. I didn't realize to what degree until after I was gone. Um, because I really got, uh, I learned some lessons there that really propelled my writing career to this day. Yeah. So had the, again, the anniversary of robbery was right. just last week, 31 years ago. Wow. I mean, it, yeah. it's either it was like yesterday to you or not, but. A some long of it time. does feel like yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. But um, it's amazing that much time has passed. But it's so interesting because you mentioned it like Jerry and Larry, they they had such control over the show. Like and it was the literally what I think the fourth episode in, they kind of handed the keys over to you on, on that episode. Like how'd that how'd that process Well, they handed them to me on the first draft. And and um and but there was and this is true on every show I've been on, no matter whether I'm in charge of it or not in charge of it, those early shows go through some heavy revision. Um, and Larry and Jerry revised their own drafts quite a bit, and they revised the robbery quite a bit. Uh, because you're finding the show there, you know, the dynamic that was unique to that show was Larry and Jerry were so calm and confident. I don't want to say Larry was calm. That's not true. <laughs> Jerry was just very calm and confident about his vision, and Larry was just adamant about sticking to the vision. So NBC would give, you know, when we did deal with like the network president, the acting president at the time, we would get typical sitcom notes and they were absolutely wrong for the show. Um, but the Castle Rock executives were able to translate those notes break them down into something that Larry and Jerry could digest, and then they would address it in their own voice. And that is really one of the miracles that helped that show, which started slow, stay on the air. So there was a lot of revising going on all the time. Um, and but, but being the first one they didn't write was a change um, because they, I, I, you know, I think, uh, yeah, I'm trying to remember exactly, but I'm pretty sure Larry found that bit where 
George decides he wants the apartment after he's trying to convince Jerry to take the apartment and they do the choose thing. I mean, yeah. that was definitely those guys because I didn't grow up with the choose. We called it something else. But, but, um, why did I put out two? Yeah, 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 yeah. which was brilliant. Um, so it, that show, I, because it was the first show I worked on, I didn't know it at the time, I worked on many others after that was really like a miracle symbiosis of, of like the actual president of the network being in the hospital, Brandon Tartikoff, and uh, late night and special shepherding the show who really didn't know how to do a half hour, which was to everyone's advantage because no one told us we were doing it wrong. And the Castle Rock executives really believing in Larry and Jerry and taking crappy NBC notes and translating them into a, you know, cause they the kind of know they would give us, how about Jerry goes to his high school reunion and tries to look like he has a nicer car than he has, like total crap idea that any show could do. And, and but they would find a way to break down those notes into, um, into something that those guys could address in their voice. So, and I think the robbery was like the biggest one of those. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and so we're huge fans of season two and season three and season three, particularly we, we yeah. pretty, pretty much put it the best season. We sometimes go back and forth to season five, but I think season three is probably the best season of the show. And I think season two pound for pound is too, because it was only 11 episodes and you're there for, for the bulk of that. I, I was curious, uh, you know, how not, not so much specifically, but just generally, like the the credits work i mean i see things like story editor or program consultant yeah. producer written by teleplay all that kind of stuff i'm assuming and we talked to you know we talked to peter malman who was obviously a, a writer and producer on the show yeah. but um you know to get your take on on what it was like having your hand in some of these amazing episodes i mean the season three episodes i mean you know you're talking red dot alternate side the cafe the pen these these episodes limo uh yeah. you know they're in our top 10 top 20 but um how does it work when you're in is there i know that larry and david in the end are going to touch every single script and make sure that it's right. what they want right but how much time you know are the other writers and things like that getting involved and, and maybe you could touch on that a bit well when i was there it was melman wasn't there yet um we didn't overlap uh, i was there with larry charles and larry and jerry and then pat hazel was there as well you know that most of the story areas came from one of our lives like the robbery that happened to me but i don't know how well you guys know la me and my roommate lived in studio city he talked to me into going to a party in santa monica which well if there's traffic is you know two hours away sometimes mm -hmm. hour and a half and then he met a woman and left me there and 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 I was stranded. That's where the kernel of that idea came from. It happened to work perfectly with Kramer, uh, with George leaving with a woman and then waiting on Kramer to right, pick right. them up. She actually um, made love to her. <laughs> it's under a lot of pressure. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but that's where story areas would come from. We did not have a writer's room. We didn't have a traditional room. Larry and Jerry were in one office. I was in an office. Larry Charles was in an office. We'd go to lunch together. A lot of that conversation would happen then. And, you know, once I remember Larry just walking into my office and saying, hey, I need a golf thing for Kramer. And I said, it, it's in the hips. It's all in the hips. And then like that, that went in. So, um, so that's how that show happened. It was more informal the way, the, the way it was. And, you know, Larry and Jerry would just sit across a partner's desk from each other, Larry scratching it all out on a legal pad, all by hand. And they would just talk out that show. Um, I mean, of all the brilliant things Jerry did, picking Larry David to, to be his partner <laughs> on that show is really tip top. Because they because that show is about language. It, it's about cadence. It's about New York. Um, and everybody says it's about nothing. I think it's the last thing it's about. But yeah. they they really had the language. I mean, what I didn't understand when I was there until I left, because it was never really said, but clearly Larry knew it, and you can tell by the finale, is that shows about selfishness. Like those characters have all the selfish feelings we all have, 
but they act on it. That's what makes it so funny. But that's right. why the, the appeal is so universal. Different generations. I was doing a play in Arkansas, Fayetteville, Arkansas, and I had to, I was help getting it on its feet. And we they were doing a tech rehearsal. We needed some CO2 cartridges uh, for an effect. And I didn't have anything to do at that point. So I, I'll go get them. And I go way outside of Fayetteville. There's this big bubba of a guy working behind the counter that's just lined with guns. And he asked what I wanted the cartridge for. And I said, I'm working on a play. And he said, what else have you written? And I mentioned Seinfeld. And he, Seinfeld, are you kidding? That's my favorite show. <laughs> he like, be, and because that show, not only is it New York, it's Upper West Side. Not only is it Upper West Side, it's Jewish Upper West Side. Like it's so specific in its voice, but it's so universal in that selfishness thing. That's, that's why that shows. You, I mean, if you know that the specifics of that world, you get a double treat. But uh, yeah, but yeah, you know. and I think it it resonated throughout the country. And I think having people like you from the Midwest, like to to kind of, I don't know, I don't want to say like safety check, but you know, it wasn't fully New York. I think it resonated with everyone. I think it was important to have uh, people like you kind of initiating that stuff. So you mentioned Larry Charles. You mentioned um, kind of. He was in one room, you were in another. So just take us through. So you were there from seasons one, two, and three. Was was I, I was there one and two. I was one not, and two. All right. Well, so it depends what yeah, I, I so, was there one and two. So let's dig into literally our number one episode of all time that we ranked yeah. was the phone message. Uh-huh. I, I talk about that episode all the time. <laughs> Tippy um, toe. So so yeah, tell us tell us a little backstory there. Like, were you how involved were you in the writing? I'd love to hear any any background into uh, into the phone message, oh, which again is our number one episode. I, I think you picked well. Um, I you know when I teach and when I go on book tour, I talk about the importance of of finding things people can connect to. I don't remember being involved in that episode. I remember talking about episodes I wasn't there for, like the contest, because that was a real thing. That I knew that to just be a true story. Um, and I and then I because I was still friends with those guys after I was gone, I found out, oh, there was Friday, they shot a show on Friday, they had to go to the cable on Monday, they didn't have a script. So Larry just went home over the weekend and wrote up that story that I knew. I mean, he did it with a great skill and craft, but uh, but that always existed. So I don't remember where the phone message came from, but um, you know, the reason that I think that show's so great is because we've all left a message of some sort we regret it, whether it was a voicemail or a, sent a text or an email, whatever. And most of us just say, I'm sorry, <laughs> but those guys hatched a plot <laughs> that was brilliant to go steal the message. And that it keys into something we completely understand, which is that selfish impulse. And then they make it so brilliantly funny by having them, you know, all those little plots they had that led to Art Vandelay, in importer, exporter, all that stuff is so brilliant. Yeah. So, so I don't, I, I can't honestly say I was, part of that because I don't if I was I don't remember it so which I guess which episodes from from like I said pound for pound season two is right up there too were there yeah. any episodes that you were heavily involved in like maybe the jacket or any others in season the two jacket jacket Chinese restaurant uh um pony remark um Love the pony remark. Blank, I can't I don't uh parking did I say parking garage um, uh, I don't remember them all, you know, it was so long ago, but, um, these things so seem to organically come, just come out of those guys' lives. I mean, all the writers who were there, I know contributed to some degree from their own lives, but stuff would happen in Larry's life on a daily basis. And I still haven't seen shows made out of them. He's really that guy. Um, so, uh, I mean, the thing that I remember most about being there is Larry was not allowed to go to network meetings at NBC because he was too volatile. 
<laughs> so this was before Larry Charles was on board. So they just brought me to have another body in the room. Um, it's me and Jerry and the Castle Rock execs. Maybe Tom Sharonis was there. I don't remember. But Jerry pitched out like the next couple of shows we were going to do. And NBC said, well, we don't think you should do those. We think you should do these other things that were not good. And Jerry listened patiently. And he said, I hear you. We're not going to do those. And NBC said, uh, the acting president said, I'm the president of the network. This is my note. I think you should seriously consider it. And Jerry said, we're going to do the show we want to do. If you don't like it, please cancel us. I'm very happy being a stand-up for the rest of my life. And seeing that, sitting right next to him when he said it, and with the calmness and the confidence he and the truth that he said that with, like you can't get a better, better education than that. Um, it was really lovely to see. That's yeah. incredible. I mean, that's conviction. That's confidence. Yeah. That's everything right there. Honest. I mean, that's, that's really great to hear. Uh, and that's why this thing makes it, you know, it takes something like that to, to make a show like this. Um, another person that's key to all this that you mentioned, you just brought his name up that I, we wanted to ask about is Tom Sharonis as the director yeah. of all those, you know, obviously through the first five seasons, um, you know, to us, the show takes a complete turn after him, uh, after he leaves, you know, just, just a different kind of show, it's, you know, it's a different sense of humor. It just kind of goes a little bit, right. I mean, obviously after Larry David leaves, it goes, it's a, almost a third. Yeah. Show. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you know, I was, maybe you can just kind of touch on what it was like to work with Sharonis, how much he got, how much the writers worked with him or, or, you know, was he in, it was, he kind of just stayed out of the way until the script came to him. Um, how much he brought to life a script, maybe worked with the actors. Well, he really helped bring it to life. Um, I don't remember him when I was there. I don't remember him getting involved in the writing, but he really did kind of a heroic thing. You know, before Seinfeld, a lot of TV shows were two or three um, acts and two or three or four, maybe five scenes. And when they started doing more and more scenes, that was unheard of. And it's a huge uh, pressure on the director. I remember, you know, because I after I left the show, I was still on the same lot and I go hang out with those guys and say hi and visit set. And I remember seeing Tom and uh, I said, hey, how's it going? And he said, 26 scenes in 22 episodes. Like that was monumental back then. So he did a great job. Um, you know, those those three actors that worked with Jerry were incredibly gifted. But I know Tom helped us find things. I can't remember what episode. It's in those first four. I think it's the first four. Jerry and George are in line at a bank. They're like talking while they're kind of marching up to the velvet ropes. Mail and bonding. Mail and bonding. Yeah. 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 So and George had a line. I don't think it ever made yet. Yeah, that, that was with Kevin Dunn, mail and bonding. Yeah, that was a great episode. Um, uh, George had a line about like waking up with a girl like waking up in his bed and finding uh a, pulling a bra out from under his pillow and saying whose bra is this and it was written in a very jokey cadence and we weren't making we couldn't get it to work and i remember jason who's so talented if he tom said if he knows it's a joke it's not going to work as well as if he's just playing attitude and like, that was a huge thing to discover pretty early on. And then Jason, you know, with just attitude, just it's hilarious, yeah. So you mentioned Jason and, and I can't believe we haven't got to them yet. The, the three characters you mentioned, yeah. right? Um, Michael Richard, Jason Alexander, and obviously Julia. Julia came in, you know, after the, the pilot, but share some stories on that. How, how did, how how was how were they represented to you? Like how did you write for them? I know like we've seen through the years there's kind of drastic changes. Uh, we, we always say kind of Jerry was probably the most consistent throughout the nine years. Um, right. G George to us is probably the, the greatest TV character of all time, but yeah, even he takes a dip in in later years. And Elaine similarly has has changes, and Kramer gets a little cartoonish. But I'm just curious in those early years, um, kind of how did you write for each character and, and kind of share some stories on 
on kind of just the excellence of all three? Well, um, uh, Jason's the first one I met. He came into the office uh, right when he arrived from LA. Elaine had not been cast yet. And I remember when Jason came in, he was wearing a toupee because he wanted George to wear, wear a toupee. <laughs> and and, and uh, <laughs> Jerry and George said, no, no, that's not gonna happen. I remember Jerry saying, you know, Castle Rock, one of the principals was Rob Reiner. Rob Reiner's dad, Carl Reiner, right. created the Dick Van Dyke show, which he originally created for him. He wanted to play the, the um, Rob Petrie character, but the network said, no, you can't, you're not a TV star. You can't, but that, and that's kind of what happened with Larry and George. Like Larry, Larry was George. Jason brought his own thing to it and completely made it his own thing. But I tried to write George as I would write Larry. That that's what I did. Um, Michael, you know, I told you about when, when those guys were in New York writing, and I was in LA, and I talked to them on the phone. And this happened more than once. I'd be they were writing in Larry's apartment, and I'd be talking to Jerry on the phone, and Jerry would say, "Shh." I go, "What?" He said, "The real Kramer just walked in." Like you know, he didn't knock. He didn't. He just and he, he just came in. Uh, he's looking for something in the kitchen. Uh, uh, it's an apple peeler. Okay, he's got it. He's gone. Okay, so that's that's how the real Kramer was. Michael took that to a whole new level. I remember the very first rehearsal we had, where he hit the door jam on his way in, with that kind of spastic move, and the whole set shook, and half the people on stage had fallen down they were laughing so hard i mean it was like a three minute laugh and and you know michael just fed off that and that character started getting big and there was a i don't know if you guys know about this i think it's in that very first not elaine episode where jerry calls kramer kessler yeah it calls him kessler yeah yeah it made it and, and the reason was Castle Rock did not want to name Kramer after the real Kramer for legal reasons. Right. So the real Kramer was willing to sign everything away. <laughs> but I remember being in the office with Larry when he was on the phone with Kramer and saying, listen, I don't know, Michael's found this very big, broad thing with this character. It's not that, it's not you anymore. It's, it's turning into this big thing. I don't know if you want your name to be associated with it, but it, obviously the real Kramer did. So that, that was my biggest memory of, of that. When, before Julia came in to read, she was, she was busy with another project and we thought she couldn't, she wouldn't be able to audition. And I don't know if other guests have told you this, but Elaine was going to be Megan Mullalik, uh from Will and Grace. And, and I remember that because Jerry just thought her name was so Irish sounding. He was saying it like a leprechaun all the time. He was just walking around saying, ah, Megan Mullalik, Megan Mullalik. So, um, so Irish, Scottish, what's the difference, Lassie? Yeah. <laughs> and then something changed in Julia's shooting schedule, whatever movie she was working on or whatever. And she came in to read and I was sitting in the little office. It was just a Mark Hirschfeld, the casting director and Jerry and Larry went into the small room and I was sitting outside and Jerry walked out and just said, yeah, she's it, that's it. And, and that was it. And the key, the, the kind of the code for writing her is just write her like a guy as much as you can. Oh, so, yeah. Interesting. So that, that kind of ties back when I think about them making the pilot in season four, like, oh, we haven't written for Elaine yet. Like, what, what would a woman say? So I'm, right. I'm assuming had a right for you had a similar conversation with Larry and Jerry about that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, very much. They, they, I think in the beginning, and, and this happens to almost all uh, creative people, you have a vision of what you want to do, and it didn't include that character. So when they were told you kind of have to put that character, a, a woman in, if you want the show, that they pushed back against it. And so they said, okay, if we have to write a girl, we're just gonna write her like a guy. Julia, of course, made that, you no one ever thought they were watching a guy when Julia was out there. Um, uh, but, but, but that's the thing. I mean, the, the only rules we had were, and you probably heard this, no saying I'm sorry, no saying I love you. That those were the rules. Love it. 
yeah, yeah. It's, it's funny it's funny um i'm curious just on a you know just your your trajectory i mean you you said you were a stand-up comic you meet jerry and then he puts you on a show you're 26 27 years old 25 yeah. years old and i mean so it sounds like you weren't thinking of that as a career but it turned out to be i mean you did a, a whole bunch of shows after it i mean was well, it actually sort of like, i was I was thinking of that. Oh, as so a was he? Okay. So Jerry yeah. asking you wasn't kind of out of the blue. It was more like, here's a chance. Let's do this to kind of get you. No, in. and I stayed friends with him. I remember he was doing an HBO special okay. and he got a, he bought like a Macintosh, the old original Macintosh, right. just yeah, like the, little yeah, towers with a little black and white screen. Yeah. And because he needed to write up his special and, and a guy named Joel Hodgson was helping him. I don't know if you know who Joel is. He's the, if you've ever seen Mystery Science 3000, yeah. uh, he's the guy who's in space. He's r really, a, if you ever have a chance, check out his Saturday Night Live and Letterman sets he did when he was a young comic. But the, neither of them could type. So, and I could type really fast. So, so Jerry brought me in to type. And so I, I was talking, you know, when we were, they were writing his special, I would chime in a little bit um and and do some typing and i think so jerry could see i had a writer's sensibility at, at that point as a yeah. as a as a what is your favorite episode maybe that you weren't there for or were there for uh, of the show i mean what sticks out to you when you think of like seinfeld what's like you know what are you what well are you i can tell you three things i mean the phone message um maybe four the phone message the the contest because I knew that to be a real story and I was just so blown away by how well Larry was able to execute that as a 22 minute television show. Um, and those very early things, uh, I, I think they're often, the importance of them is discounted like parking garage in Chinese restaurant and the robbery because there was one story back then. So, you only had to track one thing and you would see how all those characters reacted to the one thing, the robbery. And a lot of this is Larry and Jerry uh, in, in the rewrite. Jerry's getting robbed. George is invested in, in, in finding Jerry a new apartment for George's career. Kramer's invested because he left the door open because he was watching The Bold and the Beautiful. So he's trying to find Jerry's stuff. Elaine's invested because she wants Jerry to move out so she can get his apartment. And then George becomes further invested when it turns out he wants the apartment too. So you got to know those characters really well through one story. And then after you got to know them, my example I always give is like, you know those four characters, you're with them all the way. Then one of them says he's a marine bi biologist. Another one hits a golf ball into the ocean. It lands in a whale spout. He washes up on the shore. And someone says, is there a marine biologist there? And you, you buy it. You don't say, this is stupid. Because you know those characters so well. Because they, they took the time in the beginning in those slower episodes to get to know them. So that's kind of how I see that the growth of that series. That's so interesting. So yeah. that that whole structure was just pretty much done on purpose to create, I guess, uh, character and brand equity. So the, so in the future, when they went kind of a little further and trying to connect in all these stories, to your point, it just, it was easy and it, you didn't have I to. I think some of it was on purpose and like in a lot of creative stuff, some of it was serendipitous because Larry and Jerry really liked the minute in the beginning. They loved just the language, focusing on language and, and and talk about you know they would talk about the Van Wick and uh, right. Riverside Drive and and that was not off putting to non New Yorkers because it just like people talking about how to get from point A to point B in their knowingly way and and so they focused on the minutia and I know there was a point when I was there that NBC said we want bigger stories and Larry said and I'm paraphrasing if they want bigger stories I'll I'll give them bigger stories. <laughs> And that's, but fortunately we knew the characters well then. So um, so that's, I think it was a combination of things that, that made that happen. So uh, an underrated episode that we love and wrote was The Stranded, but tell us about that. Cause you left in season two, 
But the right. sh- and whenever I think about the strand, I think that belongs to season two because George was still working in real estate. But right. it aired in season three. Can you? Is there any background? Yeah, I can't remember how those airing things went. Um, you know, we started as a um, as a spring show with those four, and so I don't even remember if if it started up again in the fall, if it was another mid season, they want to shoot the 22 together rather than split them up for economic reasons. Um, so uh, that's, that's all I remember. And I wrote it with those guys, um, not in the same room, but it was like back and forth, back and forth. And I got, I got to ask you just um, a couple of things on that show that point out a big fan of ours goes by the name white Mike Wichter who sold plastic straws. Uh-huh. <laughs> Did you come up with that name? Was it a friend? Of yours? Almost all those things came from Larry. Did it? Okay. Like, like I, you know, in the, in the stakeout, and I, I think I still remember this 30 some years later, Saget, Bennett, Oppenheim, whatever that, Taft, whatever yeah. that law firm is, those are all <laughs> friends of Larry. Um, um, and, uh, and so, uh, and I'd later, like decades later met some of those people who, and they were like, I was the guy mentioned, Larry mentioned me in the, uh, <laughs> there was a lawyer named Stephen Pocatillo who's mentioned in something. And that was a, like a fraternity brother of Larry's in college, so. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's interesting you just mentioned the Van Wick and you, we were talking about the characters earlier. Uh, this is just my take on it, but um, the statue episode where Kramer gets the statue back for George yeah. and the bus boy episode where Elaine's uh, friend oversleeps and she tries to get to the airport and she goes through the whole thing and it mentions the Van Wick. To me, that's Kramer's first, like episode of the statue and, and the bus boys Elaine's first like breakout where the character like has a major part because we we me and O'Hara watched the show live so we we were watching it as it happened live you know episode by episode and you're kind of watching it it's like it's slow it's a great show but it's kind of you know and then all of a sudden Kramer busts out with the statue episode and Elaine busts out with that bus boy scene and it's like from then on they kind of took off but I'm curious if if that was tangible uh, amongst the, the crew that like, like, you know, up until that point, Kramer was not a, ma- like he, he was there, but he'd come in right. and kind of bothered Jerry, but he didn't have like a scene stealing episode until kind of those that to me anyway, I don't know if it was noticeable or if it was like, yeah, no, well, it, let's get these guys something notice- big or anything like that. It was noticeable as they, as they started to find their own uh, things. Um, and and you can hear it. You can hear some of the same laughs in in from crew members on the stage. You know, there's mics on the over the actors' heads, and there's mics over the audience's head. And if the executives or people standing down on the stage laugh, um, it gets picked up in the actors' mics, and you can't edit that out. And you can hear uh, you can hear people. Uh, respond bigger and bigger to those things yeah so tell us a little bit about i mean seinfeld seems like it would be the dream show um you left after after two seasons um what happened i'll tell you exactly what happened i i larry and jerry for all their talent and skill and they did the show exactly as they should have they were not great leaders like they couldn't explain to me what they wanted. Uh, they didn't even try. And, and I'm not saying they should have, but I was having a hard time. Like what I know about that show now at 27 years old, when you're in the messy chaos of creating something, I couldn't quite get, I didn't get how much it was about selfishness. And I went to them and I said, I think I want to move on. And they said, okay, since then, we have both had conversations where we regretted that we did that. Um, You know, Larry Charles was from Larry David's world. And so he understood it. And he also found that niche with writing that like 1940s cop dialogue. Yeah. Which he did so brilliantly. Dark stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I I really adore Larry Charles. Uh, um, and, And so I think I was. Larry and Jerry did almost everything themselves. They didn't explain much. 
um, I had another opportunity and I and I went to work for a show that wasn't nearly as good, but I was in on casting, I was in on editing, I was, uh, um, I just was more involved with the show. I learned how to produce TV more. So that's what happened. That's why I left. I stayed friends with those guys, but but I know with Larry and I have had that conversation like, oh, you shouldn't have left. And uh, Shapiro and West, who are executive producers on that show, same conversation. Um, same with some of the Castle Rock executives. I think I was just young and impatient and they were like, whatever, we're making a show. Like, we'll just, we'll just keep doing our thing, you know? So, and you know, I, they did exactly what they should have done. Um, you cannot argue with, with that show. It, it was great then, it's great now. Um, it has the, the most broad appeal of any show I've ever, been, of any show I know about, really. Mm. Yeah, you've had a comedy career since then. I mean, uh, you know, the, the countless shows you've worked on, your, your books, and your, your, you know, you had an amazing career since then. So, I mean, things work out for a reason, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, speaking of one of those shows, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you. I was telling her I have to ask you because I was yeah. looking through and um, the um, um, Just Add Magic is one of my daughter's like favorite shows. Of, oh of yeah, all time. And I know you, you know. I was just curious, I, you know, how that came about, and I know that. Um, you know, your, your breadth, your breadth of, um, you know, different types of shows you worked on is, is, is incredible in my opinion. I mean, from kids shows to, you know, sitcom, I mean, it's just all over the place. It's just incredible that you have that sort of eye that you can kind of move around yeah. like that. I don't think it's very, you know, it doesn't see, see that too often. So that, I think I've always been moving toward writing books. Mm -hmm. Um, and, it's too long and boring of a story of how I ended up in crime fiction. And I'll probably move into more just regular fiction at some point. But I had I had written my first book, which was a mystery. I it was I got a publishing deal for it, but it hadn't published yet. There's a it takes way longer to get a book published with one of the major publishers. Once they agree to do it, it's like 18 months. So so the, that manuscript was sitting around and my agent had it and knew about Just Dad Magic and, and uh, I was between shows and sent it over there and the executive producer just loved the mystery writing. And then I'm like, I don't know if I wanna work on a kid's show but I hadn't seen it yet. I had, I had done that one kid's show, Wizards, which was great in the writer's room, but boy, did we fight with Disney. <laughs> like we <laughs> hate, we fought with Disney so much because we were trying just to make it a magic doesn't seem like a normal kid show. That's why I liked it. Like I yeah, always try and see yeah. the shows before she watches them. Like this is like a really well done show. Well, like, that show, like, the executive, the first Andrew season, Orenstein, the first uh, iteration of it. Yeah. Uh, Andrew Orenstein, who did that show, um, he really said, I don't want it to be a kid show. I want it to be a family show, which is, a show that's safe for kids to watch. And and it it was I was honored to go work on that show. Um it worked out perfectly. Um because it uh I worked on that and then I went and worked on a super weird show called Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency, which is not only the weirdest show I've worked on, it's the weirdest show I've ever seen. So yeah. Well it's funny Matt you were just talking about um getting things published and manuscripts are just all of a sudden just brought me back right to the the stranded episode Penske those bastards like <laughs> very fine. like and again you you weren't writing that but maybe that was just you know right. something meant to you that, that you mentioned that in that episode but um such such so many great lines in that episode like I, I think you know there's brackets out there there's just that like everyone always has a Seinfeld line right yeah I do want to hear what some of your favorites are but I know like one of the most lasting ones is, uh, you know, the dingo ate your baby. Like this episode right. alone has a ton. Um, I, I don't remember where that line came from, to be honest with you. I don't, I, I didn't, I don't think I wrote it. Um, I, I, I don't know if Julia improvised that or if Larry or Jerry wrote it. I can't remember. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think one of my favorite lines from the robbery is, when he's talking to the cop and he says, yeah, well, we'll get back to you. If we, if we find your stuff, we'll get back to you. Do you ever find our stuff? Do you ever find this stuff? No. That <laughs> line, <laughs> that line uh, was one of my favorites. I uh, have someone else returning my calls. That was yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's so those, yeah. 
those earlier episodes, what's kind of interesting about it is there's there's not many guest stars, right? I mean, we've had a lot of them uh, on the show, and right, you talked about selflessness of the characters, but I think what made the show great was the selflessness of the four main characters, and they let like people like Jimmy and all those people shine. But I think one of the biggest guest stars, again, I'm going back to the Stranded, um, right. was Michael Chiklis. I think he was phenomenal. Yeah. Was he? Well, he I was mean, in the robbery. Chick, no, wait. Was Chickless? No. Stranded. Uh, that that was the stranded. Uh, did you handpick it? Like, did you? How, how did he come about? Because he was perfect for that role that you wrote. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I was a baby writer, and I wasn't involved in the casting. Um, uh, Mark Hirschfeld was the casting director and did a brilliant job. Uh, yeah, he was perfect for that. Um. I'm trying to remember the guy. He doesn't look exactly like Michael Chiklis, but a kind of balding guy was the guy at the end who had moved into the apartment um, at, at, at the robbery. Um, oh, right. The guy who's, who lost yeah. a ton of weight. He's running in the park. Yeah, I'm running. I'm running every day. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then the masseuse comes in. Yeah, that was... Um, and I'm just curious, as a Minnesota guy, did you ever, uh, you know, I know there's a lot of Mets and Yankee themes throughout the show. Did you ever try to get a little like uh, Ken Herback mentioned in uh, in any episodes? I never tried because I know it never would have flown. <laughs> they, those, they would have looked at me like, like I'm Jewish. And Jerry used to say to me, Goldman, you're not Jewish. You're not really Jewish um, because I'm not New York Jewish. You know, so I was I was very aware of the cultural uh, divide um and, and plus you know when you're a writer on someone else's show it's your job to support their vision as much as you can so um i tried to learn i mean i've been to new york but i, I tried to make it as new york as i could you know yeah i mean you, you, being a part of that show at the ground floor like you were like you said the learning experience alone must have been uh just incredible to see yeah. you know how they operated and, and how they navigated it and you know to, to know that you had a hand in that uh you know it's commendable man it really is I, I i feel really lucky to have been there especially in those meetings where i saw the importance of sticking up for your vision yeah yeah i mean jerry always says it's a it's a handmade show and i think having such a small group like you larry charles Sharon is to kick it off. I mean, it's it's the dream team. So I mean, Matt, we uh we can't thank you enough. I mean, for taking this trip down memory lane. I mean, the the greatest sitcom in history doesn't happen without season one and two. And I know we know you had a huge part in that. So yes. uh, thanks, on. guys. I again, I was lucky. I feel grateful that I got to be there, and uh, appreciate you guys keeping it alive this way. You know. <laughs> Yeah, and and best Thank of you, luck man. with uh with um Dead West. Hopefully you keep uh keep Nils going. Yeah, yeah. Now next book's out twenty twenty two next summer, a year from now. Yeah. We'll be looking forward. Thank you Thanks, so much, guys. Matt. This was amazing. Thank you. Yeah, appreciate it. Really Have a good night. Too.